Hey guys, it's Liat and Casey, and we are here with episode 160. Casey, what do you have for us today? Wow, 160. That is a lot of episodes. So, 160. Raising a child is not easy, and parents deserve to be the hero. Wow, Casey. Okay, I like it. I, it I makes mean, sense with what we're talking about today. It does. Okay, good job. Case is she's getting better at the rhymes as we go. So I like to make them about a little like sneak peek into what the episode's about. And this one's a little more vague, but you'll understand once we start talking about um the topic today. So Casey and I actually are recording from afar right now. Um, I'm sitting in the Dallas office. Casey is back in her cave in New Hampshire. For anyone watching this on video, you could see the literal cave in the background. Yes, the rock awesome. design. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm here in this like bright behavior bitches studio. I wore a bright sweater to like counterbalance it. I like it. It's good. Um, I it was a Vegas bar when I first got on. She looks, there's a bar cart behind her with a lot of liquor on it. Never yeah. been touched, but. Maybe today's the day. Maybe this oh. podcast is the day. I'm just going <laughs> to get wild. <laughs> All right. So what's been up, Case? Let's let's talk a little bit about what's been going on. How's life? Our guest is chill enough that I think he'll be nice enough to listen to oh, what second. we've been up to. What's been up? Wow. Um, so much. I think that the transition to Dallas was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, and I think I'm finally finding my groove. Like Casey's got her groove back, I think, a little bit. Um, and But hats off to anyone who has moved across the country and uprooted their whole life because I was like, oh, it's going to be so easy. I'll just like, you know, act like it's like a long distance like or thing or act like um, I'm just here traveling for work. And I kept trying to trick my brain into all these different like scenarios to make it seem easier. And I'm like... Today I was at the market, I'm home and I was at the little market and they all know me in there. And that's one thing I do miss is a small town like feel, but she was like, she's like, where have you been? The cashier. And I'm like, oh, I, I, I've been in Texas. I was like, I live in Texas. And she's like, you live in Texas? And I was like, yeah. And I said it and I, I was like, whoa, I live in Texas. And she's like, oh, your husband made it seem like you were just like visiting. And I'm like, he doesn't like to admit, but I do live in Texas now. Like it was such <laughs> a liberating moment. She's like, he just said you were in Texas. I'm like, no, I live there. And so I'm finally settling into maybe I'll even get some new furniture because I literally got the cheapest shit off Amazon. Now that I'm actually settling, I'm feeling... um just independent and motivated to sit, like put some roots down, I guess. Damn. This is great because Casey was depressed for like the first six months and she kind of sucked. Is so like an understatement. Yeah. So like her energy was kind of heavy to be around. Just stop <laughs> making this about me. So, um, no, I'm just kidding. I mean, I'm not kidding, but I'm no, kidding. I, mean, our friendship has about me. I always say, or you said to me yesterday, you're like, after everything we've been through, we always come out together. Always. Yeah, it's crazy. I know. Because, like, there's different times where different ones of us suck. Yes. Right now, um, I think when we come back, we're both going to be at a pretty good space. You moved into your house. Like, what's going on with you? Um, so I've been kind of homeless for the last year. Year. Um, I decided I was going to do a little bit of construction on my house to, like, make it a home. Because I was starting study notes for the first, as you know, for the first like six years, it was just hustle, hustle. Like I kind of lived like I was in a frat house, like never making it a home. Like the warehouse was always in like one of your rooms and. Yeah, my house everything. always had the warehouse. And so when I finally took out all the merch and stuff, my house felt huge and I could like see it. And I'm like, I see some good bones here. Mm -hmm. So I decided, which was kind of crazy because it was after my divorce. I was like, well, I mean, like, how do I know if I'm actually going to be like living here? Like, is this my forever? Like, I'm kind of, I don't, but then I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to make it a place that I love to be. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of nice doing it on my own without having to talk about it with a partner because I could do whatever the hell I wanted to do. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's been stressful because 
as you know, I thought I could be my own contractor and then I failed an inspection and then all the work that was done, they had to dig up, like literally like paying for someone to like put in a shower and then paying for them to break the cement and the tile on the wall is like really annoying. So, um, but I'm, I'm excited. I moved back into my house after being in Airbnbs for almost nine months. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I feel excited. I like have been looking for like a form of stability for a place to be home. I specifically made my house the opposite of how I would naturally do things. Like the office is very Liat personified, colors, bright, wild. And so I was like, I want my home to be somewhere calm. So I had to get help with that because that's just not who I am. So I'm trying to bring in the Zen, but I'm happy to be back home. Um, I feel really lucky that I could do it and I am happy to be done. Um, and I'm not a contractor. I'm better at a behavior bitch. I'm not a contractor. That's what I learned. Stay in your lane, bitch. Stay in your lane. I literally um, was like, I see, I got a little too ahead of myself. I'm like, I could do anything. <laughs> no, like, no, you need to ask for help. And I'm happy that you did. I'm also excited to get back because, I mean, ever since I've moved, you haven't had a home. So it's been like, you actually moved twice since I've been here in Dallas. So it's like, there's never a place where we can just like chill like we used to in your house. Like, even though it wasn't like a set up place that you were like, wanted to like stay in, it was like, um, we could still chill on your couch and watch TV. And like the last Airbnb, you didn't even have a couch because you were afraid the dogs were going to piss on it. So it was, it was like nowhere to sit, nowhere to chill. We'd just be like sitting on your bed, like, all right. Yeah, like I was like kind of, yeah, exactly. I was kind of pissed off because I moved into this Airbnb and it was a white couch and I was like, no shot. I thought I was going to be there for one month. So I'm like, no shot. I'm letting my dogs like ruin this couch and I'm paying for a new couch for them. So the entire time I was there, it ended up being like six months. I didn't use a couch. Like we sat on the floor. Put it in and the then, garage. There was no and then, No, so it was in the garage there. I put it in the garage. And then when I moved out, because they were having like full-time renters, apparently the renters like wanted their own furniture. So they were just like trying to get rid of whatever was in there. So like- They gave it they, away. They to literally like put it on the curb, this couch. <laughs> and I was like, are you kidding? I haven't sat on anything in, <laughs> the irony. in six months. But anyways. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, you know, we're back, bitches. I feel it. The vibe is back. New year, new us, even though it's like March now, but we're good. Well, so, when this comes out, yeah, it's really like February 1st. And I'm trying Just to like, you want to know. yeah, I like that for you. Okay. So yeah. let's go ahead and give us a five-star review because we only read your five-star reviews. And that's your reminder to go leave us a five-star review. And if you have nothing nice to say, just don't say it. Um, and go leave us a five-star review anyways. All right, Case, what do we have today? All right. It's coming in from Two Trucks 91. The title is Applying Concepts is Hard, all caps. Yes, it is. Love the show. Got my hours. Got my degree. Still trying to pass the test. Hashtag hardest test of my life. I'm still having a hard time applying concepts to everyday life, but this podcast has been so helpful. So thank you both and your guests for helping me and your viewers apply ABA concepts to everyday life. Well, you know that we do have a really cool ass test prep company. So if you haven't joined us over in the Study Notes ABA Collective, join us. We love to have you. Um, we've got tons of resources to help you pass that test. It is a hard ass test. So let us. And be did your you friend. choose? Did you choose our guest today with this? I mean, did you choose this review because of who our guest is? Nope. Because he talks ABA language. He talks dirty ABA. Like he literally drops an ABA term every second. So um, why don't we let people know who our guest is? Special because I'm not an ABA therapist. Yeah, which is what makes it cooler. Exactly. Okay, Casey, who's our guest? All right. So, you know, we got really lucky. Sometimes we find people that we, you know, you wouldn't think we would naturally connect to. And I get all nervous having these big names on the show and this guy, not only did he come on the show before, so he he's a returning guest, which is amazing. He sent us these pins in the mail that like right before, um, I'm forgetting the, what it said. Do you remember what it said? Comfortable to? being uncomfortable. Be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's what I've been doing in Dallas. So thank you. Um, but I think he she needs a new pin as like a stimulus prompt to like remind her. Yes. Well, now I have to tell you the second pin I almost went with. I thought I was going to do a pin a year. Uh-huh. Okay. And unfortunately in the field, it's now one male, that's me, and all these young women, right? Yeah. So you're not going to believe how how my brain worked. For the second year, 
Mm -hmm. Oh, I should say that when we work with kids with anxiety, we talk about a plan B, that after if you prompt three times, it doesn't work. You don't go prompt the fourth time. Right. So the pin was going to say, ask me about plan B. And all these young women <laughs> oh said, my no, God. no. Are you trying no. to get canceled? Yeah. Are you trying to get canceled? <laughs> So oh, I love you. All right. So we, I'm going to just go quickly with, uh, though, only because we've already had him and he's amazing and he'll tell you about himself. But Dr. Stephen Kurtz woo! is an internationally recognized expert in child psychology with specializations in a number of areas, including but not limited to ADHD, oppositional and defiant behavior, anxiety, and educational challenges. He also is a founder of the Selective Mutism Programs, which is what we had him on last time about at both the NYU Child Study Center and the Child Mind Institute. He created the Brave Buddies and Mighty Mouth programs, serving the needs of children around the globe with selective mutism. Dr. Kurtz is one of only 21 certified GLOBA trainers in parent-child interaction therapy, or PCIT as the cool kids call it, which is a gold standard treatment for young children with oppositional and defiant behaviors, and often co-occurring with other disorders such as ADHD, anxiety, or autism spectrum disorder. And today, Steve is here to talk to us all about what is going on with PCIT. Welcome, Steve. We love you. We're so happy to have you back. I couldn't wait to come back. <laughs> I vote Steve as like our easiest, I mean, Dr. Kurtz. I mean, he really does deserve the respect of Dr. Kurtz, but he's just like so chill that you want to go with Steve. You know, it's kind of confusing. My it's head's cool. feeling my my head's feeling a little confused, but I vote him like our like easiest to like easiest guest, just like chill, ramble, chill, chill, yeah. chill, chill. Yeah. Yeah. Agree. Anyways, so before I think before we get into this PCIT, I I do want to talk about just kind of like defining what oppositional defiance disorder is, also known as ODD. Can you give us an operational definition there? Yeah. So uh, in the diagnostic statistical manual, uh, the DSM, which I don't think your world interfaces with all that much. Is that right? Um, don't put well, us on the spot, Steve. <laughs> well, you anyway. know what? It's not that. It's We're kind of like, we just look at behaviors as opposed to like the diagnosis, but it is helpful to know a diagnosis, you know, I think. I'm with but, you as well. I was once on a panel and a guy said, you've seen one kid with ADHD. You've seen one kid with ADHD. That's what we say but, about autism too. You've yeah. met one person um, with ADHD. So ODD, which is the uh, the acronym for oppositional defiant disorder, is essentially kids who have a really persistent, excessive pattern of defying adults' requests to do things, can be spiteful and vindictive, can be blaming others. I mean, they're essentially little shits because you just want them to go with the flow and they're they're bucking the system even when it may not be in their best interest. Right. So the old cut off your nose to spite your face kind of thing. And these differences for kids who end up getting the diagnosis is only a matter of intensity and degree, not a, like black and white, black and white, like you either have psychotic thoughts or you don't. Um, you know, you either cut your finger or you didn't. So on a rating scale of like zero to three, where zero is never and three is very much, a typical kid will end up with ratings like 0.8. And these kids end up with ratings like 2.4. Okay. Um, you know, I had my grandson. I had my grandson sleep over a, a few weeks ago. A handful of times, I had to really pull out really good behavioral technique. Uh, the other 95 percent of the time, 98 percent of the time, he was chill, went with the flow, was adaptable, did what I told him to do. So it's a, it's a, a order of uh, frequency and intensity. Is it like like? saying like a little like Kobe saying, no, no, it's like different than that. Yeah. In terms of the frequency and the intensity. Yes. Now it overlaps a bit with something that's, I hope, very controversial in your world, because it certainly is in mine, which is this PDA concept, which is not an evidence-based, you know this? No. PDA. What does it stand for? Like public display of affection? No. Um, <laughs> pathological yeah. demand, demand avoidance. Oh, I've um, heard of that, actually. I haven't. I, I'm actually surprised you guys haven't because I think of it associated with the autism ABA world. But it doesn't hold a lot of water for people like me because it's not adding anything new. It's, mm -hmm. it's describing the outcome, just like oppositional defiance. So it doesn't tell us anything about functions of behavior. It doesn't tell us anything about antecedents. It just describes an endpoint. 
isn't one of the criteria, and tell me if I'm wrong, I did not read this right before the show, but isn't it also like a lack of fear of authority? No. Um, you parents and teachers may make that attribution, but it's not one of the diagnostic criteria. Oh, it's not. I, for some reason thought it was like, like, I've definitely like heard that, but I guess it's not, people are just associating that like this individual yeah. has zero fear or respect of authority. That's an attribution that they will make. And, you know, how do we, how do we deal with inner thoughts as behavior? Uh, so that's not one of the criteria. Okay, I, wow. went to, I went to observe a kid who I would say is an eight on a scale of zero to eight for intense oppositional behavior in a school a couple of weeks ago. He had no fear of authority. When, when he started wandering and went out into the hall, he wasn't thinking that the adults had control over him. Mm -hmm. So he might be a kid that you say has no respect for authority. And I would say, as we get more into PCIT, until they're paired with him, more effectively, their limit setting just doesn't mean as much. I, I was telling you guys before we got on that I just did the teaching session for mm -hmm. the discipline phase with the family. And they're all afraid about what timeout is going to look like because that is part of the, of the protocol. And I said, guys, you have worked all these past months to increase the value of your positive attention. It's like oh. I said to them, you know how like money values, like the, the value of the dollar went up? Well, the value of your label praise has gone up so much that when you say, please put the crayons back in the bin, you've just increased the chance he's going to do it. So that fear of authority is an assumption that changes over time as you see kids soften with heavy doses of all that good positive reinforcement stuff. Okay. So now let's get into this. So, I mean, I think I was doing an Instagram live, just like rambling about who knows what. And... Steve actually like came in like writing, sorry, Dr. Kurtz. I, I literally just feel like we're like friends here. I'm, I'm, I have respect, I swear. Um, comes on and I think his name on Instagram is also Steve Kurtz. No? Could be. Yeah, I don't know. So I was like, maybe that's why okay, I'm going. But you had mentioned something about, you know, oppositional defiance disorder and people were saying, oh my God, we want a podcast on this because we work with some of these cases where the behavior is, you know, it seems so extreme or it's so difficult and, and difficult to find the function. And so people were like, this is an episode we really want. I remember people were finally staying on my Instagram live and I don't think it was because of me. I think it's because of you. So um, with this, I, I want you to like talk about, you know, what kind of client you have sent to you, um, what that may look like and what this PCIT which stands for parent-child interaction therapy looks like. Sure. Um, I get 40% of my practice is kids with selective mutism. 40% is kids who have oppositional defiant disorder and things that look like that, like intermittent explosive disorder is another one in that, in that ballpark. And then 20%, a, lo a little bit of everything else. One of the things I love about PCIT is that it's uh, diagnostically agnostic. It doesn't. It doesn't address diagnoses. It addresses the problem behaviors that that we were talking about. So we can operationalize those behaviors, and that's why I know that PCT is a good fit in the ABA world because it deals with behaviors, functions of behaviors, uh, and not uh, the diagnostic uh, labels. So PCT was started in the '70s in Oregon. The history of Oregon in all of the work that we do is unbelievably important because it was in the 70s in this very fertile ground that social learning theory was coming into play. This guy named Albert Bandura who dealt with uh, modeling and social learning, Jerry Patterson who gave us coercion theory. It was where it was all coming together. If you were a child psychologist like me at that time, you had only one tool to deal with this behavior and that was old school play therapy. And somebody along the way noticed that the kids would behave really great when they were in session. They're getting all this non-directive positive reinforcement, go out in the waiting room and all hell would break loose. And so somebody came along and said, why don't we teach parents to do what it is we're doing? So they learned about high rates of reinforcement. They learned about antecedents. They learned about consistency, predictability, and follow through. Um, so 
when PCIT was being formed, it was, it was the first of four very, very similar treatments that all are divided into two phases. One is relationship building, enhancing the value of positive attending. And then as parents, caregivers meet proficiency in those skills, it's actually a skills-based, then they graduate to learning limit setting and discipline. So what I tell people is there are actually four protocols that are almost identical because they all have this first phase that's like a child-directed positive attending phase, and then the second phase that's limit setting and discipline. I just happen to fall into the trench of PCIT, which is one of these four. And it happens, get ready for statistics, has the highest, biggest, has the largest effect size, which means that in studies, when you collapse across all the pe all the studies been done in this area, an effect size of like 0.4 to 0.8 is considered robust for a treatment. Like stimulant medication is 0.6. This is like 1.43. Uh, so it's Wait, a huge. Like 0.6 is considered good? 0.4 to 0.8 is considered really good. And this is 1.43, which if anybody cares about statistics, what it means is on average, you get a 1.43 standard deviation change in the behavior. So anything that you can move for a whole population, one and a half standard deviations is huge. And that's, mm -hmm. so that's the average effect size. Now dig this, for people who attend at least four sessions and don't finish the treatment protocol, their effect size on average is uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.5. So even dropouts benefit on average from this treatment. Not that we want dropouts. Wait, so if this is so effective, yes. and you're one of 21 certified Globa trainers, that does not seem like a large number. No, it's a, we have a problem of scalability and sustainability, um, and psychologists are terrible at marketing. I hate, I hate to say it. But so I want to also bring that back to the article I read this morning, but I mean, our field also has an issue in ABA with marketing and dissemination and a rough history. Um, but in the article that I was reading, it mentioned that, um, and it was a, I'll just say the name of it. It's a community-based agency delivery of parent-child interaction therapy, comparing outcomes for children with and without autism spectrum disorder and or developmental delays. And in the article, it talks about the clinical need for ASD services and ABA being the, you know, behavior interventions um, that have demonstrated success in reducing disruptive behavior. Um, but there's limits to children being able to get treatment due to lack of, again, the number of BCBAs out there. And that less than 40% of children with ASD will receive early behavior intervention. Um, which is such an inaccessibility um, given the, you know, one in 44 prevalence of autism. I think we're at one, aren't we at one in 36 now? Autism? Uh, I don't know. This was written in 2022. So I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's just like dropping it, but yeah, but regardless of the number, it's. It seems like PCIT is also having that issue because it is at PCIT in this article, and it does say, you can contest it. It's evidence-based and people are looking for evidence-based treatments um, to help with these disruptive behaviors. But there's only 22 of you guys. That's insane. 21. Right. 21. Sorry, right. I just have to keep correcting your numbers. You know, I'm, I'm the accuracy check here. Yeah, thanks, oh, I, actually, one, one of the 21 abdicated the throne, so to speak, to yeah. pursue other interests. So we're down to 20 global trainers. <laughs> Um, oh my god! We, we train a lot of regional trainers who train a lot of within agency trainers. Okay, so you're just like, there's still there's there's more people than 21 people utilizing this. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Okay, that's what that's what I was worried about a little bit. I was like, and no. The How are you I ever supposed to retire? Mm. He will. That's another episode. Yeah. <laughs> so the one thing I'm hearing that you were saying, and this is just because I am the test prep nerd here in terms of seeing a concept. You were saying that beforehand when you, when psychologists, child psychologists had like a, one specific method, the play therapy to use, the kids were doing amazing in the session. Right. But then as soon as they'd go out to their parents, it seems to me like a concept that we call 
behavioral contrast. Like there was this generalization too. Uh huh. Like this heavy. Well, yes, there was a lack of generalization. So we saw behavioral contrast, meaning there was a high amount of reinforcement in the session, right? So mm-hmm. the let's say the um probably the compliant behavior was increased, and we were seeing like so what happens in the other environment where there's not that same generalization of the procedures or the same reinforcement, we see it go the opposite. So like we actually see negative behavioral contrast, right? Because we see it going down in the other environment. So I'm assuming what you're coming in with now when you're going to talk about PCIT with the parent training aspect, um, we see better behavior across multiple settings. Is that right? We do. And we actively program the generalization. So one of the things we do for generalization is we go with them either remotely on telehealth or literally in person to the nearest Rite Aid or the nearest toy store and go through the aisles and practice going through following instructions with a contingent reinforcement, but also known consequences that the kid has already been shaped to be able to tolerate. So we All don't right. need a chance that they'll generalize. This sounds a lot to me like behavior skills training that you're using a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So PCIT, take me from the beginning to the end. If you were going to pitch me on PCIT, what the principles are, what you're doing, tell me, tell me all about it. And maybe we'll see if I'm sold and we should start getting other BCBAs trained in this. All right. So let's role play. You're a parent of a four-year-old. Okay. Maybe- maybe a cute little boy who's, uh, you know, defiant and all that good stuff. Uh, and I say to you, how many times do you have to tell him to do things? And I say, well, actually, Kobe's become defiant in the past two weeks. So well, I'm just going to. I said a cute little boy. I'm with you. You said four. I, he's a two. Two, two okay? yeah. So. So how many times I, do you have to tell him to do things before he listens? I have to tell him that we have to put a diaper on like eight times. And then eventually I just, I'm like. I will just tackle him down and be like, we're changing it. And by the time that happens, where is your carotid artery? It's bulging out of your neck. (laughs) I guarantee your voice print is not ways. At the next intersection, make a legal U-turn. Sweetheart, it's time for your diaper. Your voice print is definitely giving it away, right? Yes. I'd say because I am a BCBA, I specific, like I am like aware, like I'm like, I'm not giving this kid any rise. I'd be like, we're going to change your diaper. We're going to change your diaper. But like, I'm but sure like I am more crazy. escalated, but I like specifically work on being like, we're changing your diaper. But yes, when you're annoyed, I'm like, or when I'm trying to change his diaper, then he slaps me in the face and I'm just like, Egh. So uh, my selling point to you as the parent is what if I had something that guaranteed you never have to say it more than two times. You may have to say it two times. You're likely going to say it once, but what if I gave you something that you never had to say it more than two times and you never got that agitated? Oh my God. Tell me, please. And and what if we could do this in a couple of months of weekly sessions where I'm literally coaching you live? Like when you learn to drive or do surgery, you don't just have people read a book, right? Somebody goes out with you in the car. So I'm with you literally, if we're going to do this remotely, I'm literally a bug in your ear. If we do it in, with my one-way mirror stuff, you still have a bug in your ear. And the first thing, and, and so that's what you can expect from this. You can expect to have a kid who listens the first or the second time, and that it'll be fun by the time you get there. Okay. And there's, nobody, there's nobody whose interest is not piqued by that. Yeah, no, that's like porn for a mom who's been fighting their kid to put a diaper on. Right. And so we go through, I've already looked at a checklist of 36 items of the things that you're having difficulty with. So I already know which items to bring to bear as the examples. Dawdles at mealtimes, dawdles at at bedtime, refuses to obey until threatened with punishment, verbally, physically fights with siblings. I already know the the things that are getting under your skin. Okay, so you come in and now like a lot of ABA principles, you know, I'm like, okay, like, I mean, even like training my dog, side note, like, I'm like, okay, I know exactly what I need to do for him to not be so annoying, but do I have the bandwidth and where would I rather put my attention? <laughs> so with parents who want to go through this, we try and get a commitment of five minutes a day of what we call special playtime. And it's five minutes of one-to-one using positive attending skills where we've also taught them 
in a first a teach session and a role play, not only positive attending skills, but how to do active ignoring. And so we'll say to them, I, I say to them, how do you spell ignore? I G N O R E. Are you yeah. asking me? I am. We spell it I G N O R E with an asterisk. And the asterisk is that unless you're ready to pounce on positive behavior as soon as you get it, the ignore alone won't do anything. But when we pair ignoring, w waiting like a, a lion, just waiting in wait, lying in wait to pounce on some positive behavior, that combination, along with all these positive attending skills we just taught you, that's going to be half the benefit of the treatment. Now, it is true, and it is fascinating to me still, that you get half the benefit of this treatment only using the child-directed skills, not the limit-setting and discipline skills. So you, it's so just like the pairing, the pairing part, just like the, are you saying yep. just like the, Little the five attention. minutes a day of like undivided attention, a mom not on her phone, just playing or something? Yes. Wow. The family that I just did, I just, right before doing the podcast with you, I just did a teaching session for the discipline part and they said, but he's listening all the time now. I don't know that we'll get practice at this time out thing. I said, listen, the worst, the worst case scenario is we go through the paces you hit the benchmarks, he has no timeouts, and a month from now you get a little bit of a relapse and we do a booster, but that's like a best case, worst case, right? Isn't that right. amazing that they, they come to me with a kid who's highly aggressive, like I've seen him beat up his sister, his 19 year old sister in therapy session, and now they're saying we don't have anything to deal with. And that's only after they did what you guys would call the pairing, what we call the learning positive attending stuff. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing during that time? Me as the coach? No, or what are you, yeah, what are you coaching a parent to do during so that? We start out, uh, first thing we do after doing a, a intake assessment is we do a behavioral observation and we have the parent and the kid do child-led play for five minutes, parent-led play for five minutes, and then a parent-guided cleanup where the parent isn't allowed to do the cleanup, just guide it for five minutes. That's our baseline data. We then plot that your guests, you know, the other, the folks listening can't see it, but you know, we plot it right onto a graph of uh, intensity and these are behavior frequency ratings. And then every week we show them the improvements on their graph in these ratings. And what that means is we did the observation. We have a teaching session. This is positive attending. This is the behavioral descriptions. This is reflections. This is active ignoring. We role play it. Then we have them come for therapy sessions. We code for five minutes at the start of every session. So coding guides the coaching. And then we prioritize the coaching goals for that session based on the data that we coded at the head of the session. So let's say you were super great with your labeled praises. You got that. But you forgot that reflecting what he says is important too as a way to positively reinforce. So we coach on that. What will that look like? What will that reflecting look like? The parent skill or my coaching of it? The parent skill. Okay. Uh, so let's say you're the kid and you're playing with uh, magnet tiles. Say some stuff like a kid would. I make house. I make, I make You house. are making, you're making a house. That's a great house. I make rocket, rocket, five, four, three, two. Rocket. You're counting so beautifully. So part of that was just reflecting what you said. And then, of course, you know, part of that was just labeled praises. And You're letting them know that you, like, heard what they said. And, boy, how that helps with self-esteem, how it helps staying time on task, how it helps pair you. Um, and it's Salesman 101, um, old school therapy 101, right? Mm -hmm. Just positive regard for what the client is saying. Now, you also know from our other broadcast uh, podcast that in selective mutism, we go absolutely bonkers over the importance of reflections for selectively mute kids. Mm -hmm. Today, yeah. this morning, I had to shape a kid who wasn't yet able to talk to me. I had to shape his talking to his parent in front of me. So when he whispered audibly to his father the word square, I said, square, that's great. I, you know all your shapes. Now, I could barely hear him, but I did hear enough to know that he whispered square. So I'm shaping that up by reflecting it. And what parents don't get, and actually a lot of psychologists 
mental health people who don't do ABA don't get is that reflections can be positive reinforcers just the same as labeled praises can be positive reinforcers, right? But the sort of dumbed down version of it is good job saying square is assumed to be a reinforcer, right. but people don't think about reflections the same way. But I know uh, mano y mano here, we, we can appreciate reflections can be incredibly reinforcing. It just it's, doesn't make you feel heard. Yeah. So we teach these five skills called the pride skills. We teach positive, uh, we teach uh, label praise, that's the P. We teach reflections, that's the R. We teach imitation, which is simply doing whatever the child is doing. Mm -hmm. We teach descriptions, which is behavioral descriptions like a sportscaster. You're adding the purple one, you just made a house, you just added the top of the rocket. And we teach uh, and look for enjoyment or enthusiasm. Of those five skills, we can count praises, reflections, and description, and we code imitation and enjoyment just qualitatively. We don't code that as a frequency count. But the others we code as a frequency count. And then on this graph here that you're looking at that your uh, folks can't see is a target line of 10. And we want each of these three skills to be above 10 in a five minute period. And this is on the parents, their skills. This is the parent skills. So yeah. all of the progression through this is parent-based as the agent of change, not kid-based uh, on their end. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're asking parents to do 10 reflections, 10 descriptions, 10 uh, praises in five minutes, that's 30 in five minutes, that's one every 10 seconds. And that, boys and girls, is overlearning. Overlearning. That is also ratio strain. You ratio are making strain. you are making the requirement too high for the parent, and now they are checked out. <laughs> oh, that's where you have to be a good coach. Um, we also look for three or fewer of what we call don'ts, and don'ts are questions, commands, and negative talk. So in this guarded, sanctified time. Mm -hmm. protected five minutes where you don't have to get a kid to do anything. You don't have to get them to eat, change, wash. We ask them to avoid all questions because questions take the lead away from the child. Mm -hmm. We ask them to avoid all commands because these are kids who are averse to commands, to compliance to commands. And we ask them, of course, to avoid negative talk. Now, we take negative talks to uh, the nth degree, not only avoiding idiot, stupid, bad, no good. Mm -hmm. But if you're, if your little guy, what's your kid's name again? Kobe. Kobe. If Kobe says, mommy, four rockets, and he's actually got three or five, we teach parents to say, I love how you're learning your counting. This is one, two, three, three rockets. If the parent says, no, sweetheart, that's three or five, we call that negative talk. So we're boosting up these three do skills and bringing down as a goal to zero, but it's literally three or fewer. This is this is so amazing that you're actually like operationalizing what it is because I realize, you know, like there's things that I'm doing naturally because probably because of my understanding of, you know, behavior and whatever it is. But you're saying these things and you're like operationalizing, like these are the steps that you need to do. But for example, okay, my sister really struggles with one of her twin girls. Um like everything's a tantrum. She's highly emotional to so many things. Everything's a competition because they're twins. Like, I'm like, oh my God, I love your dress, Ellie. She's like, do you like it more than my sisters? You know, like everything, everything's a fight, everything like, and I so see, I'm like, when Ellie's with me, obviously I'm not her mom, you know, so kids do act up more often for a parent. There's so many things I see where I'm like, she's not doing that with me because I also am like naturally just like, you know, redirecting or whatever it is. But like to get, when I'm thinking about my sister, like I, I see it so clearly certain things. I'm like, if she just had these directions of like what to do. And also, by the way, I all my skills go out the window when it comes to family. It's like suddenly I don't know how to do anything as soon as it's. Um, I feel like this would be good for Talia to have like five minute sessions. Yes, because my sister so is. My sister's so busy. She is like a workaholic. Their attention is so valuable. Um, you know, I see it. It's like she's glued to her phone. 
Like she says, she's like, I know it's gross, like how addicted I am. She's in this corporate, whatever it is. Um, and so there's so many things where I'm like, dude, if you just like gave her five minutes of like uninterrupted, like even like without the other twin, like it's amazing what like that non-contingent reinforcement could do later on. Like, but like the fact that you're like operationalizing it, like, okay, I need you know, an increase of reflective statements, you know, because a lot of times if I just said, hey, just make sure you're giving more reinforcement. Again, every parent's like, okay, good job doing that. I like like it. Wow, that's so cool that you cleaned up, right? As opposed to being like, I'm hearing you because even this specific, like my niece, I'm always hearing her be like, but you're not hearing what I'm saying. I'm saying I was trying to say and then live. That's the other twin said on top of me, but I was trying to say, you know, so like, just like those specific things to be heard. Reflection right there. Yeah. Now, why is five minutes a day enough? And what the answer to that question has to do with why I just sat up. He got excited. <laughs> no, I'm going to tell you why this is all conditioning. <laughs> the reason five minutes a day is enough. We think is because if it's reinforcing to the caregiver, as well as to the kid, then you're more likely to generalize those skills throughout the other 23 hours and 55 minutes of the day, even if you're not doing it that, at that overlearning rate of 30 per five minutes, right? So there's this bi-directional influence that not only is the parent doing it with the kid, but the parent is being reinforced by better behavior and interaction. Maybe it's like it's negatively reinforcing it for a parent because now you're like getting rid of that aversive behavior of the child. So it's increasing the parent's behavior of doing it. Absolutely. Now, the reason I sat up when I said that is because I always think of going to physical therapy. It wasn't the hour a week that I was in physical therapy that made me human again. It was the fact that I did those skills. And like I'm sitting up now, I'm practicing the habit that I, so it wasn't the one hour a week in physical therapy as much as what I'm doing right now, which is generalization and maintenance of that from that five minutes a day, that one hour a week. Same with like mental therapy, you know, when you go and they're like, okay, so how are we going to do this with boundaries? I'm the worst at boundaries. So you'd practice it there, but it's like, now you have a more awareness the rest of the time as you're going through things. And the way I will say it to a parent who's kind of resistant, I say, imagine if at 2.48, you had just finished your five minutes of special time and then something happens at 3.02, you're much more likely to use the desired skills of positive attending to what's attendable, active ignoring what's ignorable, just by the fact that you practiced it, you know, five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago. So I just walked you through the first phase, which is getting parents, caregivers to do 10 of each of the do skills in five minutes, reduce the don'ts to zero or three or fewer. Then we teach them limit setting and discipline. And what that looks like, what that sounds like is... We teach them the eight steps of an effective command being uh, direct rather than indirect. Please put these away rather than can you put these away. Mm -hmm. um, developmentally appropriate, being 100% sure what you're telling the kid to do, they can do. And their repertoire. Now, this morning, I wasn't sure this kid knew. I had the kid parents out of the room with this selectively mute kid. I wasn't sure he knew the shapes. So I said... I drew a bunch of shapes and I said, point to the triangle. Once he pointed to the triangle, I knew he knew what a triangle was. Then I could prompt for a triangle. And if he didn't say it, it was anxious avoidance, not lack of knowledge. Okay, so direct commands, developmentally appropriate, positively stated, meaning what you want the child to do rather than what you want them not to do. And all of this, I mean, this is ABA 101, but it's not psychologist and parent 101, right? So we, we prompt for the behavior we want. Uh, which in, I think in ABA terms would be a DRA or a DRO, but psychologists don't know that and parents don't know that, mm -hmm. right? So the kid is jumping on the couch, come stand next to me is uh, a DRI. A DRI, not a DRO. I mean, uh, you can't j stand next to me and jump on the couch at the same time. So it's an incompatible behavior. Right. So we, we get into teaching what uh, prompting for uh, positively stated commands given one at a time. So even if a four-year-old or five-year-old or seven-year-old could pick up the Legos, put them in the bin, and then put the magnet tiles on the other counter, we only want them practicing one because they can follow through with one. And what do you do if you comply with one, not the other? 
And um, then they're at least coming into contact with reinforcement more often. Absolutely. And I think building that behavior momentum, I'm assuming. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, none, and now and you have to way, guide them through multiple steps and that sucks. Right. And by the way, none of these terms that we're sharing with each other, none of them are part of PCIT lingo, which is why I love APA and PCIT because I know, I know the translation. That's yep. why it's exciting. We also make sure the command is specific rather than vague. So behave, watch out, be good, or obviously vague. We make sure it's operationalized. We teach them to deliver it in, nor- in a normal tone. When I teach that, I say, tell me how you make pancakes. So Casey, tell me how you make pancakes. I put the batter into a pan and wait till it boils and then flip now, it. In that same tone of voice, tell me to... Tell me it's time to clean up and to put the Legos in the bin. Keep that same tone of voice. It's time to clean up and put the Legos in the bin. And then I would reinforce you for keeping that same tone. I good would job. Use, good job doing what? Good job putting the Legos in the bin. That's cool. Ah, I thought you were giving her a good job. I know, me too, for maintaining the same cadence. That is, what, oh wait, that is what I was doing. And then I got distracted. That's my ADHD. I totally was reinforcing <laughs> the fact that she kept a perfect tone throughout the whole thing. And then I, no, that is literally me. I forget what I was doing one second to another. So and we teach, and we teach giving an explanation before the command, but never after the command. And that would sound something like this. It's really cold out. Please put your coat on mm-hmm. rather than please put your coat on. Why? Because it's really cold out. And then inadvertently you're reinforcing delay. Yeah. I love that. Wow. You're, you're getting it right out of the way. This is why you're putting your coat on. No, okay. So you. tell me, let's say, all right. Going back, my nieces legit hate wearing jackets. It's like this, like cool thing too. It's like it's not even cold. I think it's not even like cold. It's so hard. They I'm like, all right, not- whatever. I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna take it with me, and you might want it later, right? And that gets like, to what- the last part of the effective command, which is only when necessary. So avoid. Power if struggles. You, if you look at the data, parents give commands about a hundred a day or so. So we work, I literally, I don't have it here because I'm at my home office, but I have a Nerf sword. It's like two feet long. And when I teach this part, I say, if you're going to draw the sword, you got to be prepared to use it. So that's exactly what I'm wondering. So that's what I was about to go to. So let's say you're like, okay, because once you're going to give a demand, I always say like, when you're giving a demand, you better make sure that you're ready to, to, you know, and same with the parents, like you're not going to go to Abby's birthday party. It's like, really? Well, you have plans, mom, later. So you're kind of relying on Abby's party. So, you know. Um, yeah. with that, so let's say it's like, it's cold outside. You need a jacket. You need to put your jacket on right now. Let's say they're like, no, are you then you are going to put that behavior on extinction essentially and put it on them? In PCAT, I would give the parent the option to say, you know what? I'm not prepared to follow through. If you get cold, you know where your jacket is. And there's no, I think, no harm done. Yeah. Rather than go down a road you don't want to go. Because then at that point, you're escalating a higher magnitude of the, and like reinforcing a higher magnitude of like, now they're tantruming and throwing and doing and all of it. And you're still not going to put the jacket on them. So now you're, they're going to, yeah, they've met that high level of magnitude when you could have just, at the time they said, no, fine, you know where it is. I'm ambivalent about my daughter listening to this podcast because of the anecdote I'm about to share with you. So two weeks ago in New York, it was frigging cold. The kids slept over for the weekend. Leland, it's cold. Please put your coat on as we're going to walk the dog up the street, which is a reinforcer for him, not a punisher. Mm -hmm. And he says, no, no, no. I said, I'm going to carry it. If you get cold, it'll be here. Guess what happened? He asked for it. It got cold. Yeah. (laughs) He took the coat. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we, it makes I, sense. We, you know, Again, in, like- in, um, in parenting magazine, they would say, pick your battles. And in behavior therapy, we would have other ways to describe that same phenomenon. Right. Yeah. But I think that we have to support parents to be reasonable. And if they give a command that they're not prepared to follow through with, then just back out of it. Mm-hmm. Because what you and I know is that there are going to be hundreds of opportunities coming up to teach whatever it is, the behavior that we're really trying to teach. Mm-hmm. It's, so it's we have so, these, so we have these coaching sessions in both the child directed phase called CDI and this 
limit setting and discipline phase that we call PDI. And we start very intelligently with only play commands. Then we graduate to a couple of commands, both in the clinic and in the home. Then we graduate to a so couple. What of can commands. a play command be? Can that be like, let's say I'm building a rocket with him that he's into and be like, Hey, can you pass me the red square? That would be an indirect command that we would coach you to say, uh, I'm, I want to make a rocket too. Please hand me the oh. other square. Because so Ken we, is not direct enough. Correct. Okay. And you know that whatever you teach, as long as you're consistent, the consumer, the kid will learn it. So we even say that I need you to pass me as indirect, but you need to pass me as direct. And the way I think about it is, I, I don't care if that's picky, you, you know, I don't care if somebody else sees it wrong. As long as we're consistent with it, then the kid will learn. Yeah. So we go with you need to or or would uh, or please pass. Um, so we, we teach first play commands like please pass me the purple magnet tile. Then two to three commands throughout the day like it's time for uh, routines. Please hold my hand on the way to the bathroom or please hold your toothbrush. After they get through two to three commands throughout the day, we let them broaden it throughout the day, but trying not to use too many. Mm -hmm. By this point, they have learned, the children have learned how to tolerate a, a chair timeout. Three minutes ending in five seconds of quiet so that we don't inadvertently reinforce you. The timeout is over because I couldn't take your screaming anymore. Mm -hmm. You're sitting quietly. You're ready now to hand me the purple block. The kid does it. For 25 points, why don't we say great listening? That's a question. I know, and I'm saying, I don't know. Wait, are, no, wait. Up, wait, wait, no, wait, okay. no, no, no. Here, I'll say it again. No. You're in say the scenario out. again. I'm smart You're enough. Let's hear it. Please hand me the purple block. You're not the boss of me. Wait five seconds. If you don't pass me the purple block, you're going to have to sit in the timeout chair. I'm not done playing with it. You're not the boss of me. You didn't do what I told you to do, so you have to sit in the chair. Stay on the chair until I say you can get up. Three minutes, five seconds of quiet. You're sitting quietly. Are you ready to hand me the purple block? The kid does it for 25 points. Why don't we say good listening? Because they weren't listening. Because they didn't listen. It wasn't good listening. What we yeah. teach the parents to do is to say the word okay. And then, PCIT being fucking brilliant, we immediately give another command so that the dyad gets what it's supposed to be like. So in the follow up command, you. It's like do an it. error correction. It is an error correction. And I love that. And my image for that is I'm looking out of my backyard now. I mean, I used to have a catch with my kids when they were younger. You would never end on a dropped fly ball. You will always end on a caught fly ball, right? So that's error correction and ending uh, ending on a positive note. So we and teach- break, breaking that behavioral chain. Like I do it like with my, my dogs are so annoying with food. Like he will climb up on any kitchen table, anything he can, like try to jump up for food. And sometimes- like he might get something, you know, and then he'll just like bark to get. So then I'll be like, okay, you know what? I'm not going to reinforce that. So I'll be like, sit, right? High five. And then I'll give him something. Oh, nice. Nice. Because I'm like, I'm like, I'm breaking this. Don't you dare for one second think that you're in control here. Pavlov. Yeah, I, I knew it was one of them. Pavlov. Pavlov's like a yeah. pain in my so ass. We teach this basic timeout in the play session. Then they go home and they're doing the two to three commands throughout the day and then throughout the day. Then we teach house rules. House rules is a timeout without a warning for only those behaviors for which you can't give a command because it's already too late, which is typically hitting and uh, you know damage uh, of some type. So we, we've already mastered active ignoring. We've already mastered high rate positive attending. And now we're teaching after the child has learned to sit in the chair, we teach a house rule timeout, which is uh, without a warning. And then we teach bring it out to the community. So we teach them literally to bring a magazine, a folder, uh, a, a laminated placemat, go out into Duane Reed or CVS or whatever. And we say to the child in public, we're going to practice listening and minding here in the store. And if you do good listening, we're going to get to go to the park afterwards or we'll go for a treat. If you forget to follow directions here in the store, we'll do a timeout, which would be over here. And we teach literally doing a timeout in a public in community. Yeah. Um, by the time we get there, about half the families don't need it because there isn't 
problematic behavior in public, but we go through at least that they've learned it in, in a role play. So and they graduate when their behavior ratings come within normal limits or for stats people, half standard deviation to normal on a standard rating scale. When the parents have done the 10, 10 and 10 on the do's, the three or fewer on the don'ts. And when they give 75% effective commands and 75% effective follow through of the effective commands. That's important. It is. So you're looking at both. Now. And there's one more criteria that my PCIT colleagues will uh, hit me up if I don't mention it, which is that the caregiver feels confident that they can do it after you stop seeing them weekly professionals. And that's just uh, subjective, like them telling you. Right. Yeah. Because okay. people are afraid to stop treatment at that point. They think it's they yeah. over, overly associated with the therapist, but we're not in, we're not, the only thing I'm doing with the kids is pairing. I'm modeling pure CDI skills the whole way through. So if I want, like this morning, I wanted the kid to come back. I said, I have some great toys in the waiting room, in the, uh, in the playroom waiting for you guys. Mm -hmm. I don't say, why don't you come with me? Right. Cause that would be an indirect command. Then what do I do if he doesn't? So what I want to, I, I want to know is, okay, so there are going to be times where the child or whoever it is you're working with are not going to go to their timeout chair, right? Because now they also might be in a flow of like, they're already started in like a behavioral chain of not complying. So now it's like, right, you said, give me the blue magnetile, please. Okay, if you don't give me the blue magnetile, you're going to have to go to timeout. Give me the blue magnetile, right? No. Okay. Go to timeout. Now, is this, well, okay, I'm assuming beforehand you are thinking how important is this blue tile to you? Like, is it something that you're going to be willing to, or during your phases, if that's like one of the things that you're working on, so they're like, no, I'm not going to timeout. Now you're like, I mean, you're not going to, I'm assuming, going to physically sit on a child in timeout to have them there. And so what, what, what is, what does that look like? Yeah. It, here's what it sounds like. and looks like you didn't do what I told you to do. So you have to sit on the chair, stay on the chair until I say you can get up. If they refuse to go, they physically escort the child to the chair, which is why this is an indicated treatment for two to seven year olds whose parents feel capable of escorting them there. Mm -hmm. If they then pop off the chair, they're told a once in a lifetime warning that sounds like this. You got off the chair before I said you could. If you get off the chair again, you're going to have to go to the timeout room, which is typically either the, a bathroom or their bedroom. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens almost all the time is parents anticipate all hell breaks loose in the bathroom, all hell breaks loose in the bedroom. It happened an hour ago when I did this teach session right before coming on with you guys. I said to the parents, when kids are in that situation, all they want to do is get out of the room. So they will bang on the door. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. Mm -hmm. But they don't trash the room. They just don't. I said, if you want to be extra cautious, you can close the water faucets in the bathroom. You can mm -hmm. close the, the water source underneath the, uh, the toilet. You, if you have tchotchkes around, figurines, if you want to remove them, you can do it. But I said, this is a one to two week investment of time to teach compliance. Mm -hmm. And what I would remind you guys here, as I always remind the parents is remember this, they're not learning that until they are super high rate reinforcers who know how to actively ignore mild and appropriate behavior. They don't earn the teaching session for discipline until they've already done the hard work of reinforcing. And as I said before, you get half the change in the protocol, uh, half the desired change mm -hmm. just through the CDI phase. Now, yeah. you must be dying to know what happened in the one study when they did reversal and did PDI before CDI. Tell me. Unfortunately, and we'll keep this between us, mm -hmm. the short-term gains were the same, but the long-term gains weren't. And qualitatively, none of the people who did that study would ever do PDI before CDI. I mean, just ethically, you'd have a hard time. I was going to say, you don't you always want to start with reinforcement anyways, but you got to pair, of course. Yeah. If you if you start with that one, it's like you're asking for help. But the short-term data, because the people who taught it, taught it really well. 
So they well. taught it, like all the discipline stuff I just said to you, mm -hmm. they taught it really well. And so ethically more than uh, pragmatically, none of those folks yeah. would ever do that again. But in, right. in PCIT, like with any PhD program, they did dissertations on but, every variation on the theme. <laughs> so I know ethics. I know ethically, but if you think about like negative reinforcement for a parent or anything, or the quickest way to change behavior, it is most likely going to be punishment in the short term. Like you said, Shh. Ah, take that out, Alan. Just kidding. <laughs> no, but, but also, we, I mean, it's we, also, you know, what? the same way when we talk about the importance of using treatment packages, right? So like if you're using extinction, you better make sure you're reinforcing other things or you're giving that appropriate alternative behavior in a DRA. But and, and like we know extinction by itself can work, right? But it's much more effective when you use reinforcement with it. So I feel like it's a kind of the same idea of like, okay, punishment could work, extinction can work, but we know it's more effective when it has the reinforcement with it. So it sounds kind of similar. Mm -hmm. Time out is a very um, ubiquitous procedure. It's used by a lot of people but it's in terrible political disfavor at this point. And I don't know, even though when it's paired with all this positive attending, I'm very comfortable with it. I don't know that it will survive uh, time, time out. Time. Yeah. Well, you also yeah. have to make sure that if you're using time out, that the time in environment is actually reinforcing, right? <laughs> That's yeah. what he's saying with the positive, like building that relationship is like, they want to come back, not, oh, this is great. I wanted to escape anyways. You suck. <laughs> like, let me sit in this chair. It's better than you. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's like what I'm, and, you know, I just keep going back to my brother because my brother is now 27 and on the spectrum and has an intellectual disability. And when I think back to like, you know, it, it wasn't like there wasn't as much stuff out there about autism or any of this stuff. And so when I think of the different experts, quote unquote, that we had coming in for different things, like I remember at one point, like one which like could not be okay at all. There was like a very overweight, overweight woman who like essentially like sat on him for like so long. And I just like, as a sister, I was like, what is this? My mom was like so uncomfortable. Anyways, that was one thing. Then someone else was like, put him in his room for whatever it is. My brother like turned over his dresser so that he could use it as a step stool, went out the window. And it's like some of these things <laughs> oh. as, as a parent, you're kind of like, like, so automatically I'm like just thinking of these different things. And it's like, and sometimes as a parent, like you have to like, you know, whatever it is that you're keeping, but you're like, wow, that was kind of smart, you know, <laughs> like, like impressive. Shit. Yeah. Like he was, but I, ha I have a dilemma here, guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm late for a CDI coaching session. This is not good. You need to go. We love you. And this episode has been amazing. So go get your coaching yeah, you, on. You need, you need to train as many people as possible. This is important work. Okay, go, go, go. We'll do the wrap up. You go. Just to give you a, a sense of variability and how quickly adults learn the skills. Yeah. Your mom, who is not a behavior therapist or you know anything, she mm -hmm. hit um, all of her tens on the first session. She had what? 11, 12, and 17 of the do skills and three don'ts. And the dad, also uh, not in the professions, had 20, 13, and eight of the do skills and yep. uh, uh, no don'ts in, in the first coaching session. So you make happy. sure you reinforce that. You better reinforce that. Duh. Oh my God. Well, that was amazing. Hopefully, all of you studying for the test just heard 5 billion terms. Look at my page. It's literally all behavior principles. There's not one other note except for behavior principles. I literally, I know. And I actually just sent you mine too in a text. So, so the coolest part, Steve had to jump off to go lead a CDI, you know, child directed interaction, child directed interaction. But when we first got on before we started recording, he was telling us that he was in a parent directed uh, interaction right before and he had two parents two women moms in california and he told them you know i i'm actually got to get off soon to go record a podcast um and he kind of like made a little joke he used a word that i don't even know what it means but probably like not kosher <laughs> that we use the word bitches but they were like well they kind of looked at each other and started smiling and they were like we listen to them and they're not in the field. And I think they found us probably through the Selective Mutism podcast, but so, so, so sweet. So if you are the moms that 
know Steve and are working with him and you listen to us, we just want to send you the biggest hug and love and thank you so much for your support. So you can find Dr. Kurtz at kurtzpsychology.com. You can then learn all about his work in selective mutism, um, ODD, PCIT. Uh, There's really great information on his website. So again, that's Kurtz, K-U-R-T-Z, psychology.com. Check him out. He is such a special soul. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. You guys know where you can find us. You can find us on our website, behaviorbitches.com, where you could reach out if you want to be a guest or you know someone who should be a guest or there's a topic you want the bitches to cover. We've got you. Go over there. Um, you can find us on Instagram at Behavior Bitches Podcast, Facebook at Behavior Bitches Podcast. And as always, love ya. Mean it. <laughs>